Hello, my name is Gil Zilka. Welcome to my channel. This is my series entitled Essential Classical Music, where we look at the best recordings of the major classical music works. Uh, this video is uh, taken out of my larger video covering the major symphonies. Uh, if you enjoy this, I hope you will go over and, and look at that larger one. Uh, just know that you don't have to watch it all in one big gulp. Uh, it is divided into chapters. It's real easy to just click uh, through and choose whichever symphony that you're curious about. So I hope you enjoy it. And now we come to probably the most famous symphony of all, uh, Beethoven's crowning achievement, the ninth, the choral symphony, which famously has the choral uh, uh, contribution at the end with the, the, the famous O to Joy theme. Uh, for this symphony, my top choice uh, is not very controversial. A lot of people recommend this one also. Ferenc Fritschoy with the Berlin Philharmonic from 19, I think it's 1958. Uh, 57 or 58. Um, pretty good sounding stereo. It, it may be just a tiny bit of hiss, but but very good stereo, very full sound. And and this one, I, it just really, it, it just checks all the boxes uh, in terms of drama, excitement, spirituality, uh, great playing, uh, great singing, choral contribution, and and Fritschoy just does a masterful job with this symphony. So for an all around, it, it's it's not always easy to find a great ninth because there's many more variables with the ninth because it's so long. Uh, it, it, there's so many different emotions and then you have also the choir and the soloist added in and the conductor really has to know what he's doing. So this is one that I really think that if you're looking for something that that is a ninth to live with, uh, free choice is my choice. But uh, there are several other great ones, and uh, especially with the ninth, I don't think that's one that you're going to want to have just one version. Uh, definitely one of the most famous versions is also Carrion. Uh, this is his 1976 recording uh, with the Berlin Philharmonic from that 1970s uh, complete cycle. This is actually a, a, a super audio uh, version. Uh, I, you're more likely to find it uh, in its version, the, the, the normal version that has like the white cover, uh, which I think uh, is the same for all the symphonies that he recorded with the, uh, uh, with, in that 70s cycle. Um, this one, uh, first of all, he, his, the one from the, the 1960s set, uh, that's the big debate, is, is that one versus this one. Uh, a lot of people prefer that one. I think that this is the one that Carrion is a little bit uh, uh, more loose and more dramatic. And, uh, you know, you get the full Carrion treatment. You get the, the big sound, the, the, lush, the lush sound from the Berlin Philharmonic. Uh, Carrion was just a master showman. He was very dramatic. And, uh, you know, you, you have to hear Carrion in the Beethoven Ninth. Uh, the one thing I would say, uh, for, first of all, the soloists are fantastic, but the one thing I would say is, for whatever reason, in Carrion's Beethoven Ninth, um, the choir tended to be a little bit more kind of small sounding, kind of recessed, and I don't know if that was from the way it was recorded or not, but it's, it, it's not the big wall of sound that you get with some versions. Uh, that is the one, the one little thing I would say. I, I would say if, if that was not the case, I might say this is more of an unqualified top choice. Uh, now, another recording from around the same time is Bernstein with the Vienna Philharmonic, uh, recorded in 1979. This is, again, from his uh, Vienna Philharmonic cycle. And this is a great one, especially for uh, Bernstein's sense of, sense of spirituality. It really comes through with this one. Again, he, he kind of starts it a little bit slowly. The drama doesn't just hit you over the head. Uh, so it, it sort of builds slowly. He sort of makes the, the symphonic argument, if you will, uh, you know, over, over time. And uh, it's, it's really an experience. The adagio, uh, he, he really milks the emotions in the adagio. The singing is fantastic on this version, uh, especially from the choir, very uh, just, you know, just you know, singing their lungs out. And it's, it's one of the best finales uh, of any ninth that I know. So this is, a, this is a strong choice as well. 
Uh, now, mentioned Bernstein's cycle being one of the strongest, and again, Bame is the one that I think is is maybe the strongest, and he crowns it with with a great ninth, uh, just really powerful, strong, beautiful playing, beautiful singing, uh, great recording quality. Uh, the one caveat for that one is he takes a a much slower tempo for the march that happens in the fourth movement that starts with the the tenor, you know that one, um, and it starts with the da 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 da. Except I'm doing it a lot faster than Bain does it. He does it at kind of this slow slower marching tempo, which you know you can get used to, but it 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 it, it definitely it. it it, it takes a little bit of that that momentum away and that that goes all the way through the O to joy chorus then which also sounds slower that said it's still a really powerful performance and, and one of the great ninths now for something that is really not idiosyncratic and and sounds you know kind of there's really nothing bad to say about it certainly in terms of of the tempo choices uh, or the performance quality itself is Georg Schulte with the Chicago Symphony. Uh, of course, Schulte was in Chicago for many decades, and uh, he was known, he was a recording giant. He recorded just about everything. And um, the thing about the Schulte uh, performance of the Beethoven Ninth is it's, it's a, a very sharp, uh, very incisive, dramatic, but not idiosyncratic at all. It, it, he, he just, Gives you the beta of a ninth, um, uh, and, and there's without any uh, how to put it, you know it's it's never ponderous. It, the adagio is on what some people might say the slow side, um, but I mean it is an adagio and he sustains it. it he makes it work, and then the singing is fantastic. Uh, the chorus uh, trained by Margaret Hillis, who I had the privilege of singing once in my youth, uh, singing with. Singing with um, the chorus is very disciplined, very strong. I, I talked about how Carrion, it, it sounded a little bit like a letdown because of the, of the sound of the chorus, not, not in this version. Uh, the chorus really hits you with that wall of sound that you want. So uh, this is a good central recommendation for the ninth, as is one from a little bit earlier from 1965, Hans Schmidt Isserstedt with the Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, this is sort of an under the radar version. He wasn't the flashiest, flashiest of conductors. And to be fair, it's not the most dramatic ninth, but it's a very solid ninth. Uh, it's a very, uh, it's a very spiritual ninth, and it's got fantastic singing. Maybe, maybe the best quartet of singers. Uh, you got uh, Joan Sutherland and Marilyn Horn. Uh, the, the the Rossini uh, dynamic duo uh, in the soprano and alto uh, soloist. You have James King at the tenor, and then lesser known Marty Talvella the bass. He sounds fantastic, as does the uh, Vienna Staatsopernchor. Uh, the recording is very sumptuous, very beautiful. So that's that's also a very strong ninth. Now we've talked about. Uh, stereo recordings that are in sort of the traditional mold. I want to mention a couple that are more either period or period-like. And the first one is, again, Charles McCarris with the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic. This was recorded in 1991, uh, and it's going to have, it, it has faster tempos. Even the adagio is taken at a very fast tempo. Uh, but it's it's very exciting, very energetic, and it's it's definitely another way to hear the symphony. Uh, my my one major complaint, first of all, you have Bryn Terfel on this recording, who sounds fantastic as the bass soloist. But then the choir is a little bit. They have that. Uh, I don't know how to. It, it, it's like this white sound. I don't know how else to describe it. It's like, it, it's it's not the full strong sound that you you typically want with the Beethoven ninth um, but it's it 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 still works in terms of the performance uh, the, the performance I'm trying to say is is it's it, Macaris's conception of it the the drama and the the forward momentum is still makes that worth listening to however you get the same thing with Gardner John Elliot Gardner and the uh, orchestra revolutionaire uh, wait wait 
Orchestra Revolutionaire et Romantique uh, with his Monteverdi Choir. Now the choir on this one is excellent. Uh, this is from Gardner's period instrument cycle from the early 90s that really caused a sensation. And if period performance is your cup of tea, that one along with the Harnoncourt and the Immerzeel uh, is one to look for. Uh, it's wonderfully recorded, uh, very, very strong, great tone. Uh, Gardner really uses a lot of fast tempos that challenge his, his instruments uh, to their limits. Uh, but it, you know, I almost want to say as a novelty because it's, it's, it's not necessarily a performance I'm going to live with, but it, it, it is very impressive is what, it was what I'm trying to say. Uh, and so for that reason, I recommend it and it definitely makes an impact. And that final movement, especially with the, with the excellent Monteverdi choir that really packs a wallop. So, uh, we have a few more recordings to talk about with the Beethoven ninth and, uh, sort of the last but but not by any means least uh, first is Klemperer. Uh, this is with the Philharmonia. This is recorded in 1961. There also is a 1957 recording and, and these are both live versions, not his uh, stereo studio recording, which is 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 very good but it is a little bit on the it's 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 a little lacking in energy. Uh, these live performances really brought out the best in him. And you get, you know, the, the clumper treatment with this. You get this, this, just this massive power and strength and relentlessness. Uh, the soloists are all great. Uh, the, the recording is, is uh, you know, it's, it's a, uh, a live recording. So even though it's, it's in stereo, it's, it's a little bit noisy and a little bit more limited. But there's a sense of occasion that really makes this uh, something that you must hear if you love the Ninth Symphony. However, if you're going to talk about the Ninth Symphony, uh, it's almost inescapable that you talk about uh, Fordfanger. Uh, this is probably the work with which he was most identified in his career. Uh, he never recorded it in studio. Uh, it's, it's his live performances that really show his best. And there are three that are typically debated uh, in terms of which ones Showman is best. And really, I think all three are so different from each other that I, I recommend really all three. Uh, the one I start with, though, is the one that is the most familiar to people. And this is the famous 1951 recording with the Bayreuth Festival. The Bayreuth Festival is, is Wagner's festival uh, that uh, closed down during the war. <clears throat> but then reopened in 1951, and this was a sort of a commemoration of the reopening of Bayreuth. And uh, of course, there's a sense of occasion, but it's also a really uh, fantastic performance. It's the the sound quality is is somewhat limited, but it uh, this transfer Orfeo, not not the EMI transfer that um, probably more people are familiar with, but the Orfeo transfer uh, is is pretty good. It's got good presence. Um, it's a little bit noisy in some parts. Uh, the orchestral playing is a little bit untidy. Um, the chorus sounds a little bit, you know, recessed. But that's why not why we're listening to this. We're listening to this for uh, Furtwängler's uh, wonderful interpretation, uh, the 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 drama, the emotion, the spirituality, uh, the heartfelt ad adagio. He, it's it's really long, but he sustains it. You know, the thing about tempo. It's it's not a question of how long something takes. You can you can conduct something in half the time, and it sounds like you're just trying to get through it so that the you know the audience is bored. Whereas you can conduct something in, in, in uh, you know like in this case uh, what twenty minutes, uh, nineteen and a half minutes for the adagio, but the way Furtwängler sustains it is in a way that just keeps you captivated the whole time, and then uh, the final movement it just the emotions all just really spill out. So this is the first one that I recommend to people. However, uh, he did one in 1954 with the Lucerne Festival. Uh, and this is an Audite, Audite transfer, uh, the same company as that put out this box. It's not in this box, but it is the same company. Uh, this is a really fantastic transfer. 
Uh, there also is a, a Tara transfer as well. Uh, this version, first of all, is his best recorded ninth by far. So if recording quality is something that you care about uh, and you want to hear for a Wenger to Beethoven ninth, uh, this is probably your best bet. Uh, it does have uh, all the hallmarks of a Furtwängler performance. It's very spiritual, especially the adagio and the final movement. Uh, I will say that compared to the Bayreuth uh, performance, it's it's uh, maybe just a little bit more lacking in intensity. Um, so that's why I tend to prefer uh, prefer that one. But definitely with the sound quality and you still have all the, the special qualities of a Furtwängler performance, uh, this one is still worth seeking out. Um, however, um, my Desert Island, not just Furfinger Ninth, but but Beethoven Ninth in general, is the one from the wartime, uh, the wartime performance from 1942. That's in this box, the same one that has the uh, the Vienna 1944 Eroka and the 1943 Fifth. Um, this was recorded actually, uh, I think it was March 22nd, 1942. The reason that's important is that there was a performance which was given on, uh, or either like on or the day before Hitler's birthday, April 19th, I think it was. Uh, that one, it, someone released it somewhere. Um, it's, it's not as inspired a recording, but this one, this one from March of 1942 is the famous one. And all I can say about it is it's the most dramatic and intense performance of the ninth I've ever heard. Uh, it, right from the beginning to the end. Uh, and, you know, even though the sound quality is, is it's more limited, it's muddy, it's not really bad for 1942, though. You can still pretty much hear most everything. Uh, but they were just in this zone, almost like they were just possessed. They're, they're just so deep into the music. Uh, the one criticism uh, that uh, people uh, often uh, have against this one compared to Furt Wenger's other performances is that it's maybe even too intense, maybe you know too over the top. And uh, I, can, I can understand that argument. And so you might say that the 1951 is the more balanced uh, compared to that. But if if you want to hear uh, Beethoven Ninth, unlike any that you're probably ever going to hear, uh, this 1942 Ninth is is definitely one to hear. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, uh, I hope you'll also take time to click the like and subscribe buttons. And with that, I want to wish you all a great day and happy listening.